recently, the Supreme Court found that the former presidents Gautabi Rajapaksa and Mahindra Rajapaksa are guilty of triggering Sri Lanka's economic crisis by um, mishandling the economy. How do you see this? Well, the judgment says that they have contributed to sure. the economic crisis. It doesn't say that they are guilty or it doesn't, it doesn't uh, give any sort of punishment or verdict mm -hmm. on that sense. Nothing to hide. We do agree that we have reduced VAT at that time. And we do accept the fact that we prepaid the loans. And uh, we did not go to IMF. And we wanted to go to IMF with a, with a, with a better negotiating power. We, we were negotiating with IMF at that time. But we did not go to IMF because we knew the consequences that the public has to face if we go to IMF uh, without having a proper strategy or proper plan. We did reduce that for the best interest of the people. And today, exact people who blamed President Rajapaksa for reducing that now they are complaining that President Vikram Singh has increased the VAT. I mean, IMF is just a relief package. It's not a solution. And some people, politically, we want, some of them want to show that IMF is the only solution. It's not a solution, it's just a relief. It's just a short... watching conversations with Alanki. Today I will be in conversation with the former Minister of Youth and Sports Parliamentarian Namal Rajapaksa. Now I had him on my show three years ago, uh, way before the economic crisis took Sri Lanka by storm and things have drastically changed now. Now I speak to many parliamentarians representing different parties and ideologies throughout my conversations and today I wish to speak to Namal who represents the SLPP. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being a part of this program. Um, first, let's um, talk about the Aragalia. The whole purpose of the Aragalia was to bring about a system change. Has this system change been achieved? Well, the question is whether Aragalia, it, it actually began, it began, the beginning of Aragalia was, I do agree it's for a system change and people want something new. But the question is halfway through the Aragalia, was it actually heading towards a system change? Or was it addressing the political needs of certain individual political parties? So I believe uh, no, if the answer, if you want a short answer, no, because uh, system is not something that you can change overnight. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, it's, it's, it's a process and uh, it's, about, it's about upgrading the existing system. Yes, we like to use the word system change because that is easy to communicate. But... Uh, I personally believe it's all about upgrading the system and making it more user friendly and get more, uh, make it more closer to the public, you know, when it comes to especially citizen services, because as you know, today, uh, getting something done from the public sector is, is a headache. I mean, you have to go through a huge documentation process. And at the same time, there is a lot of red tape and it's all manual. It's all manual. So I believe if you're really looking at change in system, the first approach would be would be digitalizing the citizen services. Uh, that includes driving license, passport, or, or or even things like samurdhi, or now we call it aswasuma, but the beneficiary schemes. And um, it's it's a process that has to take place. I believe a transformation program for the next five to ten years. All right. Uh, when people talk about the Aragalia, some of the uh, uh, relief they actually wanted. Uh, people wanted relief from economic hardships and accountability in governance. Have you found solutions by now? See, it's 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 all about what you actually achieved from Aragale, you know, and, and, and if you actually look at most of the kids who were in Aragale as part of the current administration, I mean, if you look at the president's office, you get most of the people who were in Aragale working at the president's office and at the same time, uh, most of the people who led Aragalia is now representing all political parties, mm -hmm. including our political party. Some of them have joined us as well at the moment. So it's 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 all about politically motivated in the other day. It's you know the entire concept of Aragalia, and uh, there were genuine people. There were people who actually wanted a change in the administration system, but the majority of them actually used Aragalia as a stepping stone uh, for to for their political career and. And as a result, most of them have landed in all our political parties at this stage. But moving forward and moving forward, I think uh, we need fresh ideas. We need fresh thinking coming into the administration system and to the political system. 
so that is something that all political parties must and have have to work you know looking at the, the future of this country moving on to the next question um recently the supreme court found that the former presidents gotabaya rajapaksa and mahinda rajapaksa are guilty of triggering sri lanka's economic crisis by um mishandling the economy how do you see this well the judgment says that they have contributed to sure. the economic crisis it doesn't say that they are guilty or it doesn't it doesn't uh, give any sort of punishment or verdict mm -hmm. on that sense uh, see the question is whether the supreme court has a mandate to question or give a judgment on government policy mm -hmm. and keeping that aside i mean it's it's nothing to hide we do agree that we have reduced vat at that time and we do accept the fact that we repaid the loans and uh, we did not go to imf and we wanted to go to imf with a with a with a better negotiating power we we were negotiating with imf at that time but we did not go to imf because we knew the consequences that the public has to face if we go to imf uh, without having a proper strategy or proper plan we are, we will end up uh, expect accepting everything imf says mm -hmm. so it is it is it is nothing that i need to hide or to defend we did reduce that for the best interest of the people and today exact people who blamed president rajapaksa for reducing vat now they are complaining that president vikramasinghe has increased the vat mm -hmm. and the the person who went to court who is a professional and same same person comes out on media and says that professionals are leaving the country because there is too much tax in the system so i believe all these are politically motivated mm -hmm. and they do not have a plan and i personally think having a simplify simple tax system and simplifying the tax returns uh, digitalizing that on the long run and make it more affordable mm -hmm. or or without burdening people too much it will actually give you a better revenue on tax Uh, than uh, trying to burden people with too many taxes right i understand that um it is necessary to abide by the imf regulations but at the same time like you said um are there no other alternatives there is i mean see the first thing is i mean imf is just a relief package it's not a solution and some people politically we want some of them want to show that imf is the only solution it's not a solution it's just a relief it's just a short period of time look at what happened to argentina you know they went to imf before us and some of our own parliamentarians took argentina as for example and today argentina hasn't come out of the crisis mm -hmm. and if you look at countries like malaysia or uh, and uh, and if you compare malaysia and then if you compare with indonesia in 1994 i think when if uh, correct me if i'm wrong when they went to imf malaysia did not go to imf but they came out of the crisis in 5 years or 10 years but Indonesia has took a longer period of uh, to come out of the crisis so only way out i believe is to get the domestic economy strengthened mm -hmm. get the smes running give them more concession i mean today if you look at the fuel cost electricity cost and then tax on imports of raw material i don't think any of the industries will survive i mean I, even if you look at gem industry earlier it was only about 2.5% flat on gem but now today you have 18% flat and uh, Sri Lanka is not the only market for gems anymore you know it's it's, it's a global market and it's a global play, play, playing field mm -hmm. even for investors i mean they will also uh, look at better returns i mean they will look up look for better returns they are not investors are not charitable organizations anymore so they will look for countries where they can have a better return i mean tax is all about competition i mean it's about competition right so there are regional countries who are competitive on tax who are giving concessions on electricity who are willing to give concessions on uh, uh, imports mm -hmm. for raw material so they can attract more investment coming into those countries so we have to be competitive we have to be competitive when it comes to taxation uh, we have to be competitive when it comes to infrastructure which we have done most of them we have ports we have airports we have highways our road network is good and we have skilled labor it's all about government policies to attract more investors coming into the country and creating jobs so imf yes it's a relief package or it's a it's it's something to put you on track mm -hmm. but imf is not the solution and imf is not going to be the solution its only solution is going to be for us as a country to improve the life standards of people mm -hmm. help the smes protect the agriculture sector fishery sector uh, do your own economic model you know we you need to have your own economic model moving forward in this country you, can't, you cannot depending 
you cannot be dependent on another country or you cannot depend on a model that has been successful or failed in another country. But Sri Lanka is unique and we need to have our own identity and we have our own issues. So we need to identify that and then, you know, strengthen our rural economy, help the SMEs. And that is the way forward if you're looking at a long term uh, solution for this crisis. All right. Uh, well, the presidential election is due to be held this year. Mm -hmm. Can we expect uh, the SLPP to back President uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe in the upcoming presidential election? Well, it's, it's, it's still debatable mm -hmm. within the party. Uh, and we believe we are. President Vikram Singh, yes, he was the best solution at that time. And he has done a good job. He has, he has uh, bring back normalcy to the country. Mm -hmm. Because political stability is key if you, if you want to have a, a stable economy. And we believe the SLPP played a major role when it comes to political stability. Because if, if, if SLPP has backed off supporting President Vikram Singh, we would have gone for two or three parliament elections by now. Like mm -hmm. what happened in the rest of the world. But no, we believe even though most of our policies are compromised, we have a responsibility be responsibility of having political stability in our uh, country. So moving forward, we as a party, we think, we believe that we need to strengthen our grassroots. Mm -hmm. We need to reorganize our party and we need to address for the best interest of the Sri Lankans and also uh, national security and also looking at moving forward as a nation. So we will take that decision when the right time comes. And I'm sure our party seniors and party members will take the right decision and we will back the winning candidate. All right. Um, many, you know, there's a uh, view held by many in public uh, that the Rajapaksas and current president have a mutual understanding. They support each other and they have their backs. Is this true? Do you agree? Well, I mean, it. it I think the story started long years ago when my uh, father was uh, the president of this country, where Mr. Vikram Singh or Honorable President Vikram Singh was the opposition leader. But their relationship goes far beyond. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they entered politics together. I mean, my father is uh, 55 years in politics now. Mr. Vikram Singh is 45 years in politics. So they have spent a lot of time together in politics. They know each other. Uh, and um, But we do our own thing, you know. We have our own policies, we have our own way of handling things. My father has his own unique style of doing politics. Mr. President Vikram Singh has his own, I mean, has his own style of doing uh, politics. Uh, if someone is saying that we have understanding, mm -hmm. then I have to question them whether that understanding is part of putting me behind bars three times during their last government and getting my grandmother to come and give statements in FCID for so many hours. No, uh, there is, I mean, there was no understanding as such, and there won't be understand that, that kind of uh, relationship between us. But yes, my father get along with most of the politicians, and um, they have been in politics for a long time. And their generation politics is not something personal; it's all mm -hmm. about policies. Uh, unfortunately, so-called modern-day politicians are trying to mix their personal life with politics, and they want to show that. Politics is all about personal relationship or, or policies. There, is, there are no policies, but it's all about your own well-being. No, it's not. Uh, you can you cannot have permanent enemies in politics or friends in politics. It's about it's about your party's policies, or political party policies, and national interest. So my father and President Vikram Singh has always stood by uh, the policies they believe in. All right. Before we move on to a different topic, I just remember I interviewed, uh, when I interviewed the current president two years ago mm -hmm. uh, on my show, I asked him, um, where have we gone wrong? And then he replied saying, we all played too much politics. Do you, do you agree with his statement? Well, up to a certain extent, mm -hmm. up to a certain extent, when it comes to campaigns, they all play politics. I mean, you look at now the current opposition. Exact people who wanted us to go to IMF, who blamed President Gotabe Rajapaksa for not going for IMF, mm -hmm. did not vote for the IMF when he comes to parliament. And the uh, same people who said that taxes are too low, why did you reduce so much tax? Are now blaming President Vikram Singh, why are the taxes are so high? It's too much. And if you look at certain government officials, now they come to parliament committees and say, they, we have never called ourselves bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. The governor says we have gone for bankruptcy. The finance secretary says no, we did not go for bankruptcy. Right. And uh, even if you look at parliament, you know, it's it's all about uh, political politics that speak that they speak most of the time. But I personally believe, I mean, I, I personally believe moving forward, we need to restructure ourselves as politicians. Mm -hmm. 
and I take this example, you know, it's, it's just that the teachers or, or the lecturers cannot be corrected by their students. They have to correct their profession. They have to make it more professional. The lawyers cannot be uh, corrected by uh, the clients. The doctors cannot be advised or client, patients cannot advise doctors how to run the medical profession. So the client cannot advise lawyers to run legal professions. Likewise, uh, politicians cannot expect the public or the voter to rectify or correct your political your politics as professions, mm -hmm. as professionals. So it is up to the politicians to correct ourselves. And if you look at uh, most of the political debates, you know it's more entertaining than a drama in your in in the TV channel, right? I mean, if it's sometimes it is more entertaining looking at a political debate rather than looking at a teledrama. drama. Mm -hmm. So whom to be blamed? The politicians to be blamed. And if you look at parliament, how how some of the debates are taken place, how, how we speak, uh, people take us for a joke because of that. Mm -hmm. And you cannot expect the society or the voters to correct yourself. The, we have to do that. Right. I think that's what uh, uh, President Vikram Singh has meant by saying that we are playing politics too much because that generation, to be honest, my father's generation or President Vikram Singh's generation did not do that. And even if they go for a TV debate, they always spoke policies. They had their own differences. I mean, when the government changed, there were a lot of victimization. And a lot of people complained that it was during Alagare that our houses were attacked. No, our houses were attacked in 1983, 84, 85, early 90s, during Premadas government, during JVP uprising. So that politics has been there in Sri Lanka for a, the long, for a longer period. But unfortunate thing is I thought the 88, 89, 83, 72 incidents will not happen in educated society. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, still keep on repeating it. So which means uh, some of our political parties and politicians hasn't reformed. They haven't got mature or they don't understand what the, what, what the world needs. Mm -hmm. But this is something that is concerning and we as young generation politicians from all, across all parties should address. And... Um Something that is very um, interesting to see is that the support for the NPP is rising at an exponential level. Does this mean that people are losing faith in the opposition as well? Of course, if you ask me the question of whether people have faith in the opposition and their structure, no, people don't have. Mm -hmm. About NPP or JVP, because NPP is just a correlation they're talking right. about, the actual structure is JVP. They do run a very structured campaign that I have to accept. Again, the question is, whether they have the capacity to address and to deliver. Because you, me, anyone can talk about the issues that people are facing. People know that. We know what we face. But can you find tangible solutions? You know, that is, a, that is going to be the challenge. We have heard many leaders who speak really well, but who did not manage to put that to practice. Mm -hmm. Or who was not being able to deliver what they promised. As a result, most of the budgets were not implemented. Most of the manifestos that were given, given by the political leaders were not implemented. So I don't think NPP as a, or, or JVP as a political unit, including with MPP, has that capacity to deliver what they talk. And if you actually listen to most of their speeches, it's all about uh, history. They talk about Rajapaksas mainly and they talk about allegations and they talk about corruption but they don't talk solutions people need solutions people know there's, a, there's an issue if there is corruption go to courts and jvp was heading the fcid at one point during the mm -hmm. government and it was mr anrukumar disanayaka secretary who was the secretary of dushan Mardana committee at that time and they took us to courts they took all of us to courts but end of the day it's not about talking it's about delivering and if you and, and, and today, unfortunately, there are, there are a lot of legal barriers in our system where any politician can say anything in parliament and get away. Right. So they use that to victimize individuals, not even politicians. They use victimized media. They use that, that to criticize judges, which we saw a few months ago. They use that to threaten businessmen. And they use that to threaten public mm -hmm. because they have that parliamentary privilege. So right. they are behind... They have been backed by uh, the parliamentary privileges. So I think all of us, including JVP, SJB, UMP and SLPP, you know, we need to understand this and we need to come up with action, not, not just 
talking. All right, let's shift our attention to geopolitics. Um, the Sri Lankan president has sent um, a Navy ship to the Red Sea to protect international seas. What are your views on this? Was it necessary? Firstly, I mean, whether we have the capacity to go on this, on this kind of a mission, that is the question that Navy has to answer. Uh, secondly, we do have the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. where we believe we have responsibility of protecting. But what we're trying to help now is something out of our jurisdiction or not, or, or you can word in a different way, but it's, it's, it's not within our, our territory. And it is an agreement between US and UK with Israel. And I, have, I don't see any valid reason why Sri Lanka should be part of it. Mm -hmm. And I believe by, by doing it, we just exposing ourselves for unnecessary uh, trouble. And uh, it's a decision taken by the president, maybe with good faith. He might be having his own reason. But I, I, I personally believe it's something that uh, we shouldn't get involved with. And we can easily work with India for the Indian Ocean protection, which we have been doing. Mm -hmm. And how do you see um, the online safety bill? I mean, some see it as a regulation of social media freedom, and there are many international companies such as Google who are actually opposed to it. Mm -hmm. There has to be certain amendment to the bill, mm -hmm. but there has to be certain regulations as well to put things right. Uh, because there is there's freedom, there has to be freedom, but there has to be responsibility as well. So someone needs to take responsibility for the statements they make. Misinformation. Misinformation or, or even criticizing someone or even uh, criticizing someone's personality or their personal life. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no responsibility taken by any individual. You just make any statement you want on social media, then you back off. Look at what happened to that girl in Ratnapura. Entire national media, social media took it out of proportion and then saying that she killed her mother. And after six months, the police says it was not her. But in the eyes of the society, Mm -hmm. Through media, through social media, she has been victimized and she has been projected as a person who killed her own mother. So what, who can give justice to her and what legal protection she has? So there has to be some sort of regulations, especially when it comes to protecting privacy. Protecting privacy is something that has to happen. Everyone has a right to upload whatever they want. Mm -hmm. whether their personal life, whether it's something else, or whether it's their professional life, they have the right. But at the same time, if they want it only to a certain segment, they should have that privacy. But where do we have that privacy? Mm -hmm. We don't. So there has to be some sort of regulations, uh, some sort of jurisdictions as well, but some, some laws to be introduced, but mm -hmm. it shouldn't be projected or implemented in way of in way of uh, limiting the freedom of speech and uh, let's talk about your tenure as um, minister of youth and sports what steps did you take during this tenure to develop or uh, do something new in in the field well when i took over it was challenging uh, because I, it's in between covid mm -hmm. and it was about everyone was talking about new norm or new normal lifestyle sports were not there it was all stopped Mm -hmm. So I need to, I had to restart all over again and there was no youth activities happening because all were inside houses and know they were locked down. And first thing I wanted to do was, I did was putting a proper sports council with Mahela, Sangakkara, Katsuri and that entire team mm -hmm. uh, to have a blueprint on Sri Lankan sports and which actually worked. I mean, we, we managed to win gold medals in Olympics and we had a 10 year plan. Because sport is not something that you can achieve your goals within four to five years or one year, two. If you're really lucky, you can have it in one year or two years. Uh, but to get actual results, you need to, it's all about continuation. You need to continue it for a 10 year period or even 15 year period. Uh, so we put that blueprint in front and we spoke with almost all associations, put them on track, funded them. And most of the associations were given direct funding by the minister at that time. And we did not just fund them, they had to give their plan for the next 10 years. So as a result, we started winning medals in two to three years time. We actually started winning now in Asian Games, in Commonwealth Games. And uh, the biggest topic at that time, even today, is cricket. So 
I personally believe if someone wants to address with the association, we should work with, we should first work on our sports law. And I think uh, the sports law has to be amended immediately or fast as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way that associations are independent, but the, at the same time, that the voting structure and the association structure, structures are given, in, given a mandate through the sports law. Because our sports law is very old, it's even before the open economy. So globally, if you look at countries like US or UK, even India, 3% uh, of the GDP comes from the sport economy, which we wanted to bring into Sri Lanka, which why we started LPL. Uh, that's why we started Football Friday. That's why we got tournaments coming into the country. We even, in fact, negotiated with certain countries to have their off-season training in Sri Lanka, including athletics, especially in the European countries during the winter for them to come and train here and other cricketing nations to come and play their home matches mm -hmm. here, which actually happened a couple of months ago, Afghanistan played Pakistan in Sri Lanka. So it's, it's a long process. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I was there only for one and a half to two years. And um, I think little, the structure was changed once I was trained as usual in Sri Lanka. Uh, that's what I want to bring it to the sports law, so no one can change it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe the current minister and the government We'll look into it in a very serious way to bring this blueprint to the sports law. So that way it will give a mandate to associations, organizations, individuals to continue that policy for the next 10 years. So if we do that, we will get results. But if someone wants results overnight, mm -hmm. it won't happen. All right. Uh, moving on to the final question. Um, you've been in politics for a while, um, for over 15 years maybe? Yeah, I mean, I entered parliament in 2010. Mm -hmm. I was 23 years old at that time. But you were engaged in politics? I was engaged ever since 19 after my levels. All right, so being in politics for um, a long time and also watching your father being in politics <clears throat> all your life, what has been the biggest lesson you've taken so far from your political career? Well, I have patience. Have patience, trust in your policies, your people, trust in yourself, mm -hmm. face challenges. Uh, today, most of the politicians, most of the people cannot face challenges. They're scared. Some are scared of defeat. Uh, some are scared of winning or responsibilities. I mean, we have seen that in the past. So politics is all about taking challenges. So if you, are, if you want to get into politics, young, dynamic, don't be afraid of challenges. You know, you face it. And face the reality. You need to face the public. Mm -hmm. Public vote for us. Just because you hide from incident. Or just because you are being criticized in social media or your family is being criticized in social media and political stage, it doesn't mean that you need to hide. You cannot hide. Mm -hmm. Politicians cannot hide and win elections or be with people. So what I learned my, from, from my father is have patience, be with people and face the challenges, you know, take it in a very positive way because challenges will not put you down or defeat will not put you down. It will teach you how you can come back. It will show you how you find solutions during hard times, which I feel uh, most of the politicians are lacking at this stage. Uh, when you do sports, the hardest games teaches you the best lessons. Mm -hmm. When you play with the hardest op opponent, you learn well because you know how to correct your mistakes and you will not do that in your next game. So likewise in politics, you know, hard times teach you good lessons. So you right. need to learn. <laughs> Thank you very much for your Thank time you. and for this conversation. Thank you everyone for watching. I will be back with another very interesting episode uh, very soon. Until then, stay safe and take care.